Fear stops us from achieving our true greatness. Are you a professional woman who is feeling stuck, unmotivated, or burned out? Are you worried about your wellness? Are you letting fear stop you from crushing your goals? If you answered yes to any or all of these, then this is the podcast for you. Dr. Charmaine Gregory, Night Shift Emergency Physician, Burnout Thriver, and Wellness Champion, along with everyday heroes just like you, will explore how to face fear in our lives and emerge victoriously. Hello, hello, Fearless Freedom Tribe. This is Dr. G, and I have a couple of things I want to tell you guys before we get into the episode. The first thing is, I'm happy to report that I had an opportunity to speak to an audience. And it was the amazing first years at CMU, School of Medicine. And I got to talk to them about facing fear and turning that fear into fuel and how it applies to their lives currently. So facing the clinical years in a a little bit, facing immediately the preclinical years and all the information that has to get digested and internalized. So that was exciting. They're a great bunch and they like Star Wars. So we were, we, we got along really well. You know, I do like Star Wars. You guys know that, right? And so the next thing is that I have a new project that I'm launching this week and I've been kind of working on it and I've been a little bit trepidatious about um, putting it out there, but I finally decided, you know what, I'm just going to have to do it. I don't care if it's ugly, if it's not completely perfect, I'm putting it out there and then we'll kind of shape it as we go. So as a prelude, as a lead up hmm, to the project being released, I'm going to be doing some master classes this week. So I'm going to be doing four of them and you can sign up to be a part of it by going to um, thepodcastinabox.com and that will get you into the master class. Basically, the master class is going to be talking about podcasting, how you can use it to revolutionize how you reach your people, how you get your clients, how you get your customers, et cetera, et cetera. So you definitely want to come and check that out. If you have not seen any of the master classes before, this might be a great opportunity for you to do so. And I am going to be talking a lot about the service that I'm going to be offering. So you're probably wondering, well, what is this service? What could you possibly be releasing? Well, earlier this year, we released the the course, right? So the podcast launch course, we released that course, that course is still ongoing. We're coming toward the end of the cycle on that. But I have been hearing from so many people that they kind of want to have the ability to just provide the recording and have everything done for them. So I'm listening, I'm listening to what you are saying. And I have talked to the team and the team and I have come up with an a, a way in which we can provide a service to you. So I am going to be offering done for you podcasting services for busy professionals, just like yourself. So if you're in the space where you're like, man, I'm on the fence. I just don't know. I've been wanting to start this podcast, but you know, it seems like there's a lot involved in that and you're just not ready to take a course to have, you know, kind of have me guide you through it and show you what to do. You just want to give me the recordings and then have me make it pretty and you're all set to launch, then this is it. This is what you've been waiting for. And so that is called The Podcast in a Box and it is going to be available starting this week. So ergo, the master classes, right? So go ahead and go to thepodcastinabox.com and sign up to register for one of the master classes this week. And if you happen to miss that, so happen to listen to this after the fact, no worries. If you go to that same that same link, you will get information about the done for you services and what we offer. And you could be a part of that. So there you go. So exciting, exciting. Stepping outside my comfort zone once again and doing this. And so 
I'm really excited about what the possibilities are here. So got to do the engagement, talking to the medical students at CMU, School of Medicine. And, and of course, they love Star Wars, so that was awesome. And then the release of this new service this week. Ooh, I am super excited about that. So that's what I have to report. And I hope that you guys are stepping outside your comfort zone as well. You're doing something a little scary every day so that you can continue to grow into your zone of genius and you can continue to grow into your greatness, right? Right? That's what Facing Fair is all about. So let's just do this thing. So today on the show, we have a very, 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 very awesome, fiery countryman, countrywoman of mine. And she is a physician coming to you all the way from Minnesota. And her name is Dr. J. Sheree Allen. So J. Sheree is going to tell us all about what she's up to and all the good stuff and bring the goods to you. So take a listen. Hello, Fearless Freedom family, Dr. G, and we are back. Today, we have the absolutely phenomenal Dr. Allen, and Dr. Allen is going to tell you guys all about what she's up to, because let me tell you, it's a lot, and who she (laughs) is, okay? Go ahead, take it away. Oh, hey, Dr. G. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's certainly a pleasure to be here. So I'm Jay Sheree Allen, a family physician, currently practicing in central Minnesota, but uh, grew up in New York and was actually born and raised on the island of Jamaica. Big up, Jamaica. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So no, uh, currently, you know, I have a strong interest in primary care and preventive medicine. And so I see a lot of patients in the clinic in that regard. I also uh, work in our hospital setting in the inpatient forum. So that's people who are admitted uh, to the hospital just because it's a small practice. So we kind of have to practice a full spectrum. And I have found through my practice that, you know, I see very few uh, young people who come in, but then I'm, I'm struggling really to tell them about how important it is to make these really good health decisions at this young age, because it's the decisions we make now in our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, and even early mm-hmm. 50s, you know, that impact us so much later in life. So that actually was my inspiration for starting my podcast, Millennial Health, because I really wanted us to try and get the message out there as early as we possibly can, right? So if you Absolutely. do the right things now, yes, then we can hopefully present some of the, prevent some of these complications later on in life oh my gosh oh my gosh well you know <laughs> you know it's kind of like that jerry Maguire movie i don't know i'm dating myself probably by saying even that <laughs> by even saying that because some people are like listening like probably clientele, you know the folks that listen to your tribe who listens to your podcast are probably like who what's jerry Maguire?" <laughs> you know, so i'm just like channeling jerry Maguire, and, and i'm basically gonna say right now right here that mm-hmm. you had me at podcasting <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> oh my gosh. So crazy. So crazy. But no, that is, there's some really amazing uh, things that you mentioned. I mean, you're talking about practicing in uh, Minnesota um, mm-hmm. and you're talking about, when people think of Minnesota, they're not thinking about um, the place where you lived before that, right? Or the mm-hmm. place where you kind of grew up, you know, which is mm-hmm. New York City. And sort of like, wow, New York City big, bustling, you know, highly densely populated area. And Minnesota, oh, is that, does that mean that there are cows everywhere? Like, what does that mean? 
So, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just articulating what people are thinking. So. so I'll be honest. I'll be honest myself. I probably couldn't point out Minnesota on a map before I moved to Minnesota. So I'll be honest. Fair <laughs> enough. Know, I Fair actually enough. did my residency in Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic, which most people have heard of right. um, here in Minnesota. So I actually went to medical school in Nashville at Meharry Medical College, which is one of the historically black medical colleges that are still around. And yes. one of my deans actually challenged me to do a visiting medical student rotation at the Mayo Clinic. And so I took him up on the offer and I said, all right, let's go. So that's quite common for fourth year medical students to go to different hospitals and do rotations there right. to kind of learn about the different systems, broaden their horizons, increase their exposure. And I actually spent one month at the Mayo Clinic and I was just blown away at the end of that month. I was able to do so much in the family medicine department and I'd met such incredible people. And I had to think to myself, if one month in this place, you know, did so much for my medical career, what yeah. would three years of residency do? And that's how I ended up going to the Mayo Clinic for wow. residency. And mm -hmm. because I just made so many connections, I ended up staying for my first job here. No, it makes total sense. But it's just kind of funny, you know, because like we all always, our path is not um, the linear path that we think it's going to be. And it's also mm -hmm. our destinations that we end up in are usually not the ones that we perceive them to be. Um, you know, and then when you get there, you're like, oh, this is pretty cool. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I mean, we have a very, we have a mirroring um, like pathway sort of. Um, uh, I'm a lot older than you are, of course, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, you know, Jamaica as the, the launch point and then, mm -hmm. you know, New York city as the next phase and then, mm -hmm. you know, moving on to medical school, et cetera, et cetera, then having a career in medicine. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, for me, it was, you know, Jamaica, the New York city, and then upstate New York, which was, um, uh, Troy, New York at Rensselaer Polytechnic for undergrad. And then further up to the very top of New York to SUNY Buffalo, and then across and down to Duke Medical Center in um, North Carolina, and then up kind of at a diagonal to Michigan. So that's kind of, oh, wow. you know, so, so, so we're kind of still in the Midwest, like we're yes. both in the Midwest, and we, we went south for our training. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then, well, for, for you, you went, you know, for the post postgraduate training, you went to, um, to, um, Mayo, but you know, it's like this very, it's like crazy mirroring happening here. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I totally get it. Cause I never would have imagined that I would have spent as many years as I have spent in Michigan. Never. I never would have imagined that. You know, that was never on the radar. And so when you say that, it's like, man, life is really funny. Like how, you know, the, the touch points that we have along the way can determine what our destinies are going to be. And, you know, our destiny that we think at the, at the front gate is not necessarily what it ends up being. And, you know, it's good because honestly, mm -hmm. the, the things we imagine, they're not big enough. We don't think big enough and we don't have open enough minds to realize mm -hmm. that, you know, there are treasures in places other than the huge metropolis, the metropolises, you know? And yes. so that's, it, it's kind of one of the things that happens when you kind of grow up or spend a lot of fundamental years in a city like New York city or Chicago or, you know, a big city, you kind of start thinking like, okay, this is it. I don't really ever want to be anywhere rural. I don't want to be anywhere that doesn't have like, you know, I don't know, whatever your favorite coffee shop is in within walking distance or whatever it is that you feel has to be a necessity for a quality of life. And then you go to a place where there are less people and okay. there is more space and there okay. is nature and there are things that you can do outdoors. And, you know, you just learn a different kind of enjoyment. And then you understand mm -hmm. that that is a huge part of the quality of your life. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. So it's, it's just, just funny. 
you know. That was a huge one for me, actually, coming to that realization. And I think it just happened while, you know, I was living the experience. But now I can certainly say quality of life, you know, means a lot. But one of the things, too, if there are any of your listeners kind of at that crossroads that I'd also add, I mean, all you need is an airport, right? And you can get wherever (laughs) you want to go really quickly, you know? So getting home to New York from Minnesota is a two and a half hour flight, Mm -hmm. right? If I had been in upstate New York or even in, you know, say Baltimore, DC, Philly, I can still make it home quicker from Minnesota than I could had I been in one of those surrounding places by driving, you know? So So put it in perspective. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And so here's a burning question that I know everybody has. Well, maybe just me. How Mm -hmm. far away from the airport do you live? Like how many minutes? Yeah, so I was actually in Minneapolis and I was about 40 minutes away from the airport, like 30 to 40 minutes. Traffic actually gets pretty bad. Um, So I was about 30 to 40 minutes um, from the airport and that worked perfectly fine for me, but it was quite far from my job. So then I ended up moving closer to my job because I realized I spend more time at work than I do traveling. So I would rather pick up the hour and a half drive to the airport at this point and be closer to work rather than the other way around, which is what I was doing when I first moved to this area for this job. So mm, it doesn't, makes sense. yeah, it doesn't bother me uh, too much. Believe it or not, it's actually that long commute when I was living quite far away from where I was working that got me to start listening to podcasts. Oh, wow. And so all things in life serve a purpose because right. I would have never gotten into podcasts had I not had that long drive. Wow. Now that I love. (laughs) That's amazing. And so I'm sure you probably got a ton of personal development in during that time, right? Because I mean, absolutely. (laughs) That is awesome. That's awesome. And then now you're actually providing content that others Mm -hmm. are listening to while they commute. That is fabulous. Well, I mean, right now we're not commuting, but when we start commuting... (laughs) Yes. Wow. Wow. No, that's great. That's incredible, you know, because then I thought of, well, what were the things I liked hearing about while I was driving? You know, what were some of the conversations that I thought were missing? You know, all that sort of thing. And podcasting is still fairly new. I'm learning, even though, you know, it's been around for years, people are well established in this. You know, I think it's something like 800,000 or so podcasts are registered with like iTunes. I heard. Yeah, but it's it's, it's a lot of them. It might be up to a million. they're not now. active. That's mm-hmm. the thing. It's like only yeah. a, a smaller percent, a lot smaller, less, less than 50% are active. Yes. Yeah. So I was like, this is still pretty incredible because I compared it to the number of blogs. I actually started a blog at first, but okay. then I was just like, you know, this, I don't know, like the, the numbers, the viewership wasn't that great. And then I feel like I express myself a little better when I'm able to engage and really have a conversation with someone one as opposed to just putting my thoughts on paper and not being able to hear anyone else in that conversation with me. So I'm an extrovert. So I kind of thrive on like communication and feedback and all of that. So the blog I tried and that wasn't quite my thing. Then um, I actually had a life coach that I would highly recommend um, for people who are kind of trying to figure out next direction, what to do, how to pivot. And I had a coach and I told, I told her I was interested in podcasting. And she actually said, before I invest the money and the time in podcasting, why not just start trying to do some Instagram lives and see how that goes? So I actually did that. And it was very successful. I really enjoyed it. I started saving them and posting them on Facebook as well. And I started to realize that they were having a whole lot more viewers after they were saved than they did during my lives. Yes. Like I go live and it would probably be like, I don't know, you know, anywhere from around 2019, 20, you know, maybe 25, I think is the most viewers I've ever had at one point in time on a live. But then like in like two days, it's like a hundred people had viewed it. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. That's what, I mean, that's, that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. No, so totally. that gave me that ammo to say, yeah, yes. Okay. So that seeing those numbers 
is actually what pushed me to podcasting because then I knew I could leave the content there and allow people to listen on their own time and also take some of the pressure off of myself in having to be online and going live at a certain time. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. That is so awesome. Like (laughs) my mind is like, so on fire right now because (laughs) you know these are the things that like i am constantly saying i'm like oh my god just do lives do lives you can convert your lives into audio you can like have your lives you know downloaded and put on a youtube channel so other people can consume them like that Mm -hmm. is so amazing because you know Mm -hmm. that's the kind of content that people are looking for they want to be able to access those valuable nuggets that Mm -hmm. you're dropping and you know they may or may not be able to watch it while you are doing Mm -hmm. it and so having a means in which they can watch a replay is just phenomenal so wow thank you thank you thank you uh definitely (laughs) you know and it's, it's just like warms my heart when i come across other amazing physicians who are doing this because not Mm -hmm. enough of us are doing it. And, you know, like my podcast is not medical, right? I mean, yes, people come Mm -hmm. on here and they talk about things that are medical and I may talk about things that are medical, but, you know, you know, the podcasts that are talking about things that the general public can really benefit from as far as translational things, you Mm -hmm. know, like, um, you know, if you're a person who is helping others um, advocate, they are basically navigate their way through medicine. Like I can think of one physician I can think of right now is the GPS doc. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but she, mm. she mm-hmm. basically amazing lady, absolutely amazing lady. So what she does is she's, she is the translator, right? So she'll help families. She'll help uh, groups to navigate this medical system to be able to translate from medical ease into, you know, common language and, you know, be able to be an advocate for your loved one, for yourself, you know, because not everybody has medical training. And we, as an establishment of medicine, we sometimes, not well, not sometimes, we often do mm-hmm. not convey the message in mm-hmm. a way that our um our patients our tribes are going to be able to receive it right Mm -hmm. and so it's not that we're saying it in a way that is um above um you know it's not like we're saying it only in jargon because that's not really Mm -hmm. what i mean what i Mm -hmm. mean is we don't often take the time and i know for me Perhaps it may be a little bit different for you because you're doing uh, primary care and you have perhaps a little bit more time with your patients. But mm-hmm. like for a situation like myself where I'm in the emergency department and I have to build rapport like instantaneously and mm-hmm. I don't really have a whole lot of time and a whole lot of contact with the patients to be able to really close the gap and really make sure that they fully understand everything. Um, I have to really work hard to do things that are going to help to ensure that there's retention because there is nothing Mm. more frustrating for the families and for the patients, right? I'm just Mm -hmm. like thinking about being in their shoes. Then when you hear a word that as a trigger for you, like perhaps you might hear the word aneurysm, right? Mm. Perhaps. yeah. And, 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 and perhaps it's an aneurysm that is benign, right? It's an incidental finding mm-hmm. on a study, for example, and it's something that you're mm. being told about such that you can have it surveyed, right, over time. But you hear that word and mm-hmm. you know Uncle Bobby, you know, died from an aneurysm and you hear nothing else. You hear no, no other words. You, you hear the word aneurysm and mm. you don't hear, this is a small one. It needs to be followed, recheck in a year, blah, blah, blah. You don't hear that. All you hear is aneurysm. Oh, Uncle Bobby, mm-hmm. dead. I'm going to be dead too. And so, you know, these are the things, these are the gaps that it's super hard to reconcile in real time. Mm-hmm. And so you have to like start implementing some tricks. Like you have to ask the patient to talk back or to tell you back what you told them to mm-hmm. have, make sure, to make sure they understood because, or you, you may want to have like, and this, is, this is something that one of my family members has been doing, which I think is phenomenal and a great way to, um, 
advocate for your care. And I think it's almost a function of what's happening right now where, you know, your advocate can't really be at your bedside. So oftentimes mm-hmm. what's happening is happening over the phone. So what she has done, which I think is phenomenal, is she has recorded the conversations that she's had with the, the physicians. And so mm-hmm. then she's able to share that information with the family. So like, she'll, you know, she'll ask me like, what do I think about this? And, and it's, it's just amazing to kind of number one, from my standpoint, to hear how colleagues are explaining things to Mm -hmm. their patients. And then, you know, it, it, it kind of gives you a little bit of insight also into how, um, into how like medicine is pretty much the same around no matter where you are, which is mm-hmm. nice, right? So that mm-hmm. you realize that there's, there's a, there is a um, uniformity of things, right? And then mm-hmm. um, it also is good because then it helps, helps me to kind of, you know, say, well, okay, maybe direct this particular question next time. And it just gives an opportunity for your advocate to be able to advocate for you, even if they're not there. So I thought that was kind of neat. That is actually, that is, and honestly, that's the key. And that's why I do what I do, you know, trying to make this digestible and relatable, you know, I think that's so, so, so important. So honestly, any way that we can go about taking this information that we know, the knowledge that we have and getting it to people in a way that they can process I'm so here for it. Oh, totally. So for it. Totally. Mm-hmm. Totally. Mm-hmm. Wow. And you know, um, this the funny thing about that is, you know, I I kind of um I kind of was a little uh, you know, with everything going on and we can't have family come back. Like for me, working at night in the emergency department, the majority of my people, not not the majority, but there's a lot of my population. First of all, I'm gonna say I love old people. I think they're like the bomb. Um, and the majority of my population are going to be in the, the older set, more um, more advanced in age. So we're talking about like, you know, 80, 90. We have a couple of centurions mm-hmm. that come through the door. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it's like so, uh, some, I'd say 50, 50, maybe 75, 25, uh, they're functional, right? They're all in society. They're doing their thing. They perhaps are living on their own or maybe they're living in, um, the non-assisted living area, you know, mm-hmm. where they have their apartment, but there's somebody that can check on them if they need it. Mm-hmm. And, um, the, but there are those that come in that, are not in that category. They're not able Mm -hmm. to speak for themselves. And, you know, they're brought in and they're here with the emergency medical services and there isn't someone with them to tell me Mm -hmm. what the story is. And then Mm -hmm. people are stuck because now you're doing what we call um, a very broad workup essentially, because when you have no idea Mm -hmm. what you're looking for, it's literally, you just cast a wide net and then you hope that you pick up on something and you hope that you rule out what was the initial intent of item to be ruled out. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is, so I miss that fact that someone comes in with them, right? I miss that. Um, Because Mm -hmm. that gives you a lot of information. Sometimes that gives you the the piece, the crucial piece of data that you need in order to like solve the puzzle and take care of the person. But then, you know, now what I notice is that I'm calling families. I'm calling families. I'm having conversations. You know, we're talking through things. I'm explaining things. And it's just very different. I mean, I miss out on the, the social cues and the, you know, other communication factors that come from, like, the physical presence of the person, you know, facial expressions, body language, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I can't tell now, obviously, if, well, did you understand what I said, you know, or is there, or do you have any questions? Like I have to really make an extra effort to repeat myself as well. I sometimes they probably think, what the hell is wrong with this doctor? Why should you repeat yourself? (laughs) But, you know, I just want to make sure that they completely understand what's going on and that we have all the information and we are making a informed decision. If, you know, if it turns out to be something where, well, you know what, we're going to return your loved one back to the nursing home. Are you okay with that? Like, you know, I just want to make sure that nobody's going to be feeling even more isolated than they already do because they cannot, number one, they can't come back and be with their loved one. They can't be at bedside with, you know, their sweetie or with their grandma or, you know, sister, brother, whatever, and hold their hand as they're struggling in the emergency department. They just can't. And so Mm -hmm. that part is heartbreaking, but I feel like- 
the phone calls do help. They do. Help. They do. I, you know, I'm on the inpatient side of that. And so one of the things I've been doing more recently, because the family isn't there at the bedside, is at the end of the day, when I'm done rounding, I'm done with all my notes, I actually ask the patients, is there someone you'd like for me to call to give them an update on your condition? And some will say no. I was like, oh, no, you know, I spoke to them already. I told them what's going on. But there are others that will say, yes, could you please let them know what's going on? And the families really do appreciate those calls. So I definitely encourage, you know, my physician colleagues to kind of do the same thing, just checking with the patients on, you know, who do you, I'm an inpatient, you know, so I don't have anyone that's intubated or, you know, people who can't answer or speak for themselves. Um, that's not typical on the inpatient side. Those would be more ICU patients, but they let me know. And I do that for them and it makes the world of a difference. We also have a nursing home connected to our hospital. Oh, wow. And so one of the things too, is we have some iPads that we're setting up some visits you know, for families to talk to their loved ones on like, you know, FaceTime oh, awesome. <laughs> or other means. Yeah. So like just kind of going that extra mile to keep the connectedness, I think is really, really important, as you said. Oh yeah, for sure. For healing, for everybody, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's just, it, it's, I really, am, I, I'm constantly reflecting on all the things that have changed um, with this new development that we have. And, you know, some of the things, of course, I'm not super happy with, but, you know, like I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not really like a touchy-feely person, but I do like mm-hmm. to, I, I tell you, I love old people. So I really like holding their hands and like, you know, rubbing their shoulders and stuff. And, you know, we're not really doing that as much anymore. And I, I really feel like even in the emergency department, the, the power of connection through touch is huge. Like it's huge for healing. It's huge for just, you know, getting the patient to feel comfortable because I mean, you're in a place that is kind of chaotic. Well, not kind of, it is chaotic. And you're also in a place where you are essentially stripped of your usual clothing. You're not in a usual environment. You are placed in a very thin gown. It is cooler than probably your usual room. And nobody is here with you to advocate for you, to be with you, to support you. And it just is a very difficult scenario now it's huge yeah I absolutely mean, it's huge. absolutely huge so you know that's that's the thing I, I don't really like about the fact that we're not having as much contact but I do I, I do like the the, the <laughs> component where we're having you know more conversations on the phone with family I would prefer in-person conversations but obviously that's not possible um, <laughs> so I yeah. pray though that better days are ahead you know and we get to a time that we can get back to, you know, there's definitely going to be a new normal. So, you know, yes. I always tell people not to say get back to normal because you're just setting ourselves up for disappointment, but pretty much you know, at least <laughs> we can get to a middle ground, you know? So I think, you know, we just kind of have to keep pushing forward with some of these protective measures that we have in place right now to hopefully, you know, get us to that next phase of Absolutely. what Absolutely. a day-to-day life is going to look like. But I think that the other part about this process is that there is a lot of innovation that's going to be coming out of it. Like you just mentioned something innovative that you are doing in your own practice where you're making sure that, you know, they have a means because not everybody has a smartphone. I mean, Mm -hmm. I I definitely know a lot of elders that don't, they may still Mm -hmm. have like a flip or throwaway phone or something. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, providing them with a device that they can utilize to have FaceTime with their family. I feel like that is, that's innovative, right? That is something Mm -hmm. that is, that's a solution to a problem. And, Mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things I think are going to be becoming like the new expectation and Mm -hmm. should be right. And it should be. Um, but something like this always like, uh, you know, they say like, you got to have a lot of pressure to make diamonds. Like, you know, the pressure (laughs) of this situation is like going to reveal a lot of diamonds, honestly. Mm -hmm. I agree with you so much on that. You know, even just thinking about how far telehealth has come in these past four weeks has been incredible, you know, at least from the clinic side. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. 
And it's, it's funny because telehealth has been around since I was in med school and that was a long time ago, which I about like 20 <laughs> years ago. Like I remember, I literally remember when I was in medical school in our emergency department at the county hospital, they had a room, a telemedicine room. And in that room, the, the docs would go in there and they literally would see the patients at the prison. So what would happen is they would see them. They had like, um, you know, how most prisons will have some kind of healthcare worker there. Um, mm -hmm. So they'd have the healthcare worker go through the exam and then they would determine whether or not the patient would need to be transported. And that was over 20 years ago. Oh, wow. So, you know, that's to show you that 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 was the, that's how progressive they were then. And mm -hmm. it's like, wow. But, you know, tele telehealth has really not gotten the kick, the boost that it's needed to really be implemented widely on, I, mean, I hate to say it, but this, this, this crisis has brought that out. This crisis mm -hmm. has basically brought out how much foresight there is in that area of medicine. Mm -hmm. Yes. So and yeah, no. now I think uh, this is new as of yesterday. Uh, CMS is now reimbursing telephone visits at the same rate that they're reimbursing video and in-person visits now. So that's huge. That is, <laughs> that is fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. Because at least then you'll be able to like make sure your patients are okay and they're not going to be yeah. staying at home having their strokes and not wanting to go anywhere. Yes. You know I mean? And that's actually a primary concern right now. You know, we're telling everyone stay out of the clinic, stay out of the ER unless you're having trouble breathing. But there are a lot of other medical problems that don't involve you having trouble breathing. Exactly. But they are important nonetheless. That's so true. Yeah. That, that's the thing that we're, it's so funny because we were talking about that the other day, just a couple of colleagues and I, and I were talking about it and we were kind of like, well, wait a minute. Cause it, it was, the person was a cardiologist and I was like, mm -hmm. so you guys are not seeing as many heart attacks. They're like, no. I'm like, so where are the heart attacks going? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just like, where are these people who are having your heart attacks? Where are they? I think all doctors are saying the same thing. It just is mind I had blowing. That same conversation with a colleague earlier this week as well. Oh my gosh, it is so mind blowing because it's like, wait, we were having like, you know, we were having um, SD elevation MIs, which is like the kind. Just for those who don't know, the the kind that rushes you to the cath lab to go get, you know, your arteries, you know, basically ballooned open or scraped out and a stent put in, and so, um, you know, it's just really strange to go so many shifts and never to see one, you know, it's yeah. just very strange. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I just hope and pray that nobody's at home just kind of saying, Oh, it's just my indigestion and not, you know, know, not getting checked or, you know, I just don't feel right, but you know, I'm not going to go. It's probably just, you know, just probably just a common cold or something. Yeah. I just oh, hope Lord. that there aren't those people doing that. Cause that would be really, really heartbreaking. I know. Oh, Lordy. Well, it's yet to be seen, you know, when kind of we get through this and we're able to look at some of the numbers in hindsight Absolutely. and see what's going on. So until then, you know, I think podcasts like, you know, this conversation we're having and others out there that stress kind of health, I think, you know, we should continue to do a good job of letting people know that, all right, this needs to be a balanced conversation. Yes, we're saying stay home and stay safe but not at the expense of the rest of your health. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. No, for sure. For sure. Oh, wow. So you know what? We have chatted and it has mm -hmm. been a fantastic conversation, but we have yes. not talked at all yet about your fear. So we got to get to that. So I don't know which one you want to tackle, but you know, in your story, I bet you mm -hmm. that there were several forks in the road where you felt fear. I don't know if it was the transition from Jamaica to the States, which, you know, there could be a lot of fear involved in that. Or if it was a transition from, you know, New York City to Meharry, or if it was from Meharry to Minnesota to Mayo, or if it was just getting out and practicing and being, the, you know, having the buck stop with you. So I don't know which one you want to tackle. I think uh, going into practice was actually the biggest one, to be honest. Um, okay. That was huge. You know, residency is 
when you're in residency, it just seems like the hardest, worst thing that's ever happened to your life. But then you go out in practice and you realize, you know, you don't have your colleagues, you don't have that camaraderie, you don't have your preceptors or senior physicians to run your ideas by or right. get a second opinion, you know. So I think actually the, going into independent practice was my biggest uh a battle with fear, I can say in recent times, you know, just having to trust that you've had good training, you know, and taking full responsibility and accountability for the decisions that you make for people's lives, I think is huge, you know, and just kind of learning the nuances of becoming a good doctor, you know, residency, you're kind of at the mercy of your preceptor, we call them attending physicians in medicine, right. and you have to do things the way they want things done. So, you know, we would have our little jokes, you know, when a certain preceptor or professor is running our service, you know, make sure you order this test because they always ask about this test or, you know, so we have our little running jokes that way. But then when you get out into practice on your own, you have to figure out how you want to do it. What's going to be your way? you know, and consolidating for, you know, the primary care specialties, those three years of training into, all right, so what do I think is best? And how do I want to go forward with this? You know, simple things like how you document, you know, and put your notes together or the order of your work up or, you know, there are many ways to do this. I always say we practice the art of medicine, right? There are many ways to get your patient to a good outcome. And so that was actually the hardest part, believe it or not. And I really bad with that just knowing you know am I good enough it's kind of the imposter syndrome anyone everyone talks about you know am I good enough and do I really know what I'm doing do I really belong here am I really you know worthy of this role in this position you know so like fighting through that was honestly a pretty tough battle wow and so what was it that helped you to overcome that like what was it that you had to tap into I went to therapy, <laughs> so I'd encourage okay. your viewers. Yeah, to therapy, have is, therapy is good. Therapy if is there good. is a job out there for the unofficial ambassador of therapy, I'm willing to submit my application. Honestly, I think it helped me to do two major things. One, help me to reframe the experience that I was having. So when you're going through a tough time, you have almost like a tunnel vision in the way that you're looking at your problem or looking at the situation that is causing you all this anxiety or all this fear or all this stress, you know? And so having an objective person to balance some of these thoughts off of is really helpful in trying to reframe the conversation and think about the situation differently. So I think that was one big one. And then two, uh, therapy helped me to set boundaries because nice. they're just things that you just can't do. Um, maybe not forever, you know, but you can't do at this moment or things that just need to be prioritized. And, you know, I think as a, for me, it was being a new physician, but I think just for your listeners, being anything, right, new in a position, new in a role, being a new wife, being a new mother, it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter, a new business owner, you know, being in that role, you feel this need to prove yourself and, you know, validate uh, your spot or your new role or your new title. And some of that like lacks boundary setting. And I think I was really able to conquer that with therapy. So I didn't say yes to every project. And I resigned from a couple committees. And, okay. you know, I decided like, all right, I need to kind of draw some boundaries around what I'm able to do and not do to preserve myself to continue to function at my best. Wow. That is. So the bomb, because (laughs) the boundary thing, oh my goodness, that is gold. Mm -hmm. That is gold. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we don't, we tend not to have them. (laughs) That is true. (laughs) And it puts us in a bad situation because we keep saying yes to everything. (laughs) (laughs) Just, just speaking for a friend. That's Mm -hmm. it. (laughs) (laughs) Tell your friend I said hi. (laughs) She says hi back. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So that is a great pearl because I think a lot of times what happens is we feel like this is some, it's something wrong or there's some stigma around getting coaching or getting a therapist or, you know, just seeking counsel and trying to get assistance with what you're going through. And 
I don't know why that is, but um, I am super happy that you realized that and that you, you took that path because it sounds like you had some incredible breakthroughs during that time and it has allowed for you to tap into your greatness, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, that's a great, great pearl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, because I know that there are definitely people who are listening to this podcast who may be in a situation very similar to what you described. Some newness is happening and they're feeling overwhelmed and they are maybe not tapping into the fact that that is fear that is trying to hold them back from their true greatness. And if you look for a pathway, whether that might be confiding in a friend, getting involved in a mastermind, getting to see a therapist, getting into some kind of support group, something that's going to help you over that hump and off that fear fence and into your greatness is really what is necessary uh, because we all need it. Even mm -hmm. if you talk to LeBron James, he'll tell you he's got coaches. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> he's got people helping him. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's just, just funny. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Um, so you definitely have to let everybody know, like, so you mentioned the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, you may want to let people know, you know, where they can listen to it. They say the name again and yes. then, uh, let, let anybody know, everybody know what else you're up to. If there are any, you know, courses you're doing or you have any other products or anything so that, or the, how they can reach you on social so that they can reach out to you. Absolutely. So I am uh, the host of the millennial health podcast. So just Millennial Health, if you search it in any platform uh, that provides you with your podcast, you can certainly get it there. Also, I'm hosted by Buzz Buzzsprout. So it's drjshree.buzzsprout.com if you're not signed up for any of the podcasts. But I am on Instagram. So I'm at Millennial Health Doc, just DLC. So Millennial Health Doc, trying to keep the names consistent across. Oh, that's great. That's perfect. So yeah, totally feel free to like reach out and ask any questions um, there, you know. I try to provide just kind of general information as best as possible, but you know, it's always important to consult your provider for your personalized, you know, medical questions. That's right. Always have to have the disclaimer there because yep. people just like, <laughs> like, Oh, you know, my headache. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, well, um, I could tell you to go see your doctor. I don't know. <laughs> That's so funny. So, yeah. Uh -oh. Awesome. So those are all the great, great places where they can tap, tap into yes. your knowledge. So that's awesome. And yes, then, yes. you know, um, are there any new things that you are currently doing? Like, are you thinking about doing any changes with the podcast? Are you thinking about stepping into something else beyond podcasting? Is there anything on the horizon? Ah, well, no, I think podcasting, I am still learning the ropes, to be quite honest, okay. and still developing my talents there. So I'm sticking to podcasting for now. You know, the, um, remember I told you I work in a smaller practice in a smaller community. And as everyone knows, you know, this virus is kind of making its way across the country. And so, yeah, unfortunately. Being, yeah so keeping myself still free and kind of, you know, taking some of that downtime to just recover and recover so I can do a good job, you know, when I am at work, because we're right. still working at this time, you know, and that kind of brings me to a bigger point too, that, you know, through the midst of all this, whether you're an essential worker who's still having to go in, you know, every day or a couple of days per week, or, you know, you are contributing to this cause by staying home and staying safe and kind of, you know, being one of the people to not come and overwhelm the healthcare system and just like being with your family, being with your friends or your loved ones who you're currently living with. I think it's important to remember that, you know, this is still a pandemic that we're living in and it's okay to just take that mental downtime, you know, to just recover, like get your mind right, you know, wrap yes. your head around some of this stuff. So that's kind of one of the lessons I had to teach myself early on in this because I was like, oh, well, you know, when things were just kind of in early days, they weren't as crazy. I have all this extra time. I can do all these extra things. And I just had to make peace with like, no, you know, uh, in some of this extra time, I just need to recover for when things get crazy again. You know, Indeed. so Indeed. that was a big lesson for me. No, that's a great one. That is really great. 
it's okay to have downtime really it's okay, it's okay. It is. oh yep. my goodness all the type a's are like what <laughs> <laughs> no 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 but that's I that's so true it is. so uh-huh. so true you are so, so much more refreshed and like able to think in uh um I don't want to say rational fashion, but you're like, mm-hmm. you know, you, ha- you have bigger ideas and you have more, more thoughts that come to you once you've had that read and like respite. Yes. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. It's good to do for sure. Yes. 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 Oh my oh, goodness. Yeah. Dr. Allen, <laughs> this has been such a great conversation. Can you believe we've been talking for like over half hour? I can't oh believe- my God. I know. Thank it's always so we're having a fun conversation. <laughs> yeah. No, so you- this is so great. Oh, I'm pulling up. I'm pulling up the document here so I can see them. Oh, yeah. So you can see the fill in the blanks and get ready. Get ready for fill in the blanks. Yeah. Here we go. (laughs) All right. So we have our tradition on the show, which is the fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And are you sure you're ready? I am. Okay. Awesome. 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 All right. So the first one is, if I am fearless, I will. If I am fearless... I will do it no matter what. Awesome. The next one is, to me, fearless freedom means. I feel the fear and push through anyways. I got that one from my therapist. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. Who is your therapist? Good job. Good job, therapist. Oh, she's amazing. She's retiring. <laughs> oh, she is. Oh, goodness. Dear Lord, oh, good I might her. be a mess for a couple months. <laughs> Does she take like, you know, like uh, personal consults just, just, just in case? Like, yeah. She no. said no new people. Oh, she's getting yeah. out the game. <laughs> oh, I hear her. You know what? That's right. Live your best life. I, I hear her. Totally. Oh, my God. That is awesome. And then last but not least, my battle cry is... You are amazing regardless. I actually had this one from my college days when I had to be propping myself up a little bit more and just facing all the challenges and thinking we could get through this. So mine was always, you are amazing regardless. And just add whatever that situation is, regardless of this failed exam, regardless of that breakup, regardless of that disappointment. So yeah, you are amazing regardless. That's great. That is great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, for spending time, for dropping some nice pearls on the Fearless Freedom Tribe. We always love that. And, Uh you know, you know, we we love, we love, we have love for you. We do. And (laughs) then, uh, (laughs) and then also thank you for doing what you do every single day, caring for your patients and the podcast. Thank you so much for putting that out there and being a part of this movement. I feel like, you know, there needs to be more and more of us making a positive impact through this media because it is so far reaching. And, you know, so many people are just looking for quality content that Mm -hmm. can edify and educate them and you're doing that so thank you for doing it thank you and thank you so much for having me thank you for also hosting your platform and just helping us to really push through this fear because honestly a lot of people get stuck with that fear indeed indeed Mm -hmm. yeah cool thank you (laughs) 